Welcome to GTK for web developers. And if you have been developing web applications for a while, or if that is something that you are familiar with, or if that's your work, then and if you try to look at the desktop side of things and you try to um, look at how GTK applications work, then it can sometimes feel a bit daunting because the tool chain and the workflow is not something you are used to. It is not even similar to what you may have used in say JS. So it can feel slightly overwhelming if that's where you come from. But if you, if you get past that step and if you try to write an actual application and try to see how stuff renders on the screen, it, you will find that a lot of the principles are pretty much the same as they are in the web, except that they are written slightly differently, but you can carry over a lot of your understanding and it will, it, it will pretty much work the same way. So before we talk about the similarities, we want to get the tool chain part, the first step out of the way. So let us take a brief moment to discuss the languages that you may want to use while writing a GDK application. We, okay, so in web, you may be used to writing either plain JS, which includes the superset JSX, or you might be used to one of the languages which compile, transpile to JavaScript. So in GTK, we have quite a lot of options, not just the ones I have written here. You can write GTK applications in pretty much any popular language. You can totally write in Java or Go if you want to. However, these five are the ones that uh, are either supported by, uh, either like uh, they have official bindings maintained by the GNOME team, or even if they are community efforts in case of Rust and Python, they are still at least, uh, they are quite uh, stable and reliable and up to date usually. So these are the ones, these are the five languages that you might want to go into most of the time. Um, in, so, okay, so Vala is the one in which all the default elementary OS applications are written. And a good majority of the applications you find on App Center will also be written in Vala. So it is easy to find a lot of examples of things you may have seen in one application. So you can just look at the source code of that application and you can pick out what you need based on that. And that has benefited me personally a lot. And it transpiles to C code. It does not transpile, it does not compile directly to binary. It transpiles to C code, which in turn gets compiled to native binary. So you get all the performance benefits of C of native code while still not having to write uh, actual C code because C might not be everyone's cup of tea. So Vala gives you a lot of high level features. And if you have even seen even written simple applications in either Java or C Sharp, then Vala will feel at home for you. Of course, you can still write uh, direct C, but um, if that's your way, if that's what you like, then of course, more power to you. Um, there is Rust, which will also, which also uh, like C and C++ compiles to native binary code. So you get uh, the performance benefits and memory safety benefits, but in Rust or, okay, in any other language besides Vala, you do not get uh, Granite or Granite depending on where you live. So Granite is this uh, library, which we will talk about later in the talk. And uh, it is a first party library maintained by the elementary team, provides a lot of uh, useful stuff. We'll talk about it, but it is only available if you use Vala. If you want to use those patterns in another language, you will have to implement it yourself and uh, maintain it, maintain parity with Granite, which might not be what you want to do. So that's it. Uh, JavaScript, of course, you as a web developer, you might be tempted to use JavaScript, which is a perfectly fine choice. But one point to note is that uh, the version of uh, JavaScript bindings that uh, is most commonly used is GJS, maintained by the GNOME team. And a lot of the GNOME applications are written in GJS. So it is quite stable. 
However, it is based on the Spider Monkey JavaScript engine, which powers Firefox browser. It is not based on Node.js, so you cannot uh, take an arbitrary NPM dependency and expect it to work inside your application. So keep that in mind if you do pick JavaScript. You can, however, uh, use dev dependencies at your uh, local development setup. And uh, you might want to use, say, Babel for transpiling, or you might want to use ESLint or Prettier, or stuff like that. And it will do its job on your development machine. However, when you ship that uh, application, you will have to ship it in a way that complies with the GJS standards, which uh, does not really work with common JS or the standard uh, Node.js module system that you may be used to. So keep that in mind. Um, Python is a great use case when you want to use one of the uh, libraries which uh, which only ship with, which are only available in Python. I recently saw this application called Quick Word by Adi Hezral. It uses the NLTK, the Natural Language Toolkit. The it's a popular natural language library for Python. And if you have a specific dependency like that. It, this is a no-brainer. This list is not for you. You just pick the language in which it is available. But uh, if you have a doubt, if you are not sure what to pick, go with Vala is what I would suggest. Um, OK, so let's talk about the similarities. Uh, and starting with the DOM that you are used to in the web world. In GTK, we have something very similar. Everything is a hierarchy of elements, except that uh, instead of uh, that being a document being directly available, you have to create a window object. You, like you have to manually create it. And it represents a, a, a window, a standard window that you see on the GUI. This is, and this is a simplification. It is not the, this is a, but uh, enough, that is enough to understand the concept. And uh, each window has a tree. And the tree is comprised of different uh, widgets. Widgets are comparable to elements. And each widget has properties, which you might call attributes in JavaScript. And the term property makes a lot of sense in terms of GTK, because when we say uh, property, it corresponds. So each widget is an object, as in the object-oriented programming object. So the term that we commonly use in object-oriented programming to define the data that we associate with objects is property. So each widget has properties, which is quite straightforward if you think about it that way. And once you are familiar with these terms, uh, you can understand a lot of the documentation that you will find. And speaking of widgets, uh, GTK comes with a lot of inbuilt widgets. Uh, I mean, it requires three pages to so much as demonstrate those. And it has everything you might imagine from all types of inputs, combo boxes, check boxes, toggle buttons, progress bars, step to progress bars, range sliders, font pickers, color pickers, loads of stuff. It has, sorry. So this library is uh, quite vast. It is much vaster than what you have in HTML. So. So when you want to, so you will not uh, require third party, like not require additional libraries for a lot of the stuff which you do on the web. And uh, if you look at a site called Valadoc, you can explore all of these options and you can see how they work, how they, how you can create them. And we'll get to that as well. And how do you create this stuff? How do you get this stuff on the screen? So, okay, so this talk uses Vala for all the examples, but uh, you should be able to translate it to pretty much any language because it works the, mostly the same way. In fact, uh, most of the code that is written here is nearly valid JavaScript. So it works the same way in pretty much any language. Okay, so manipulating this tree, this hierarchy of elements is something that uh, uh, for which I would like to take a page from the React book. 
um, in react you are used to writing jsx which is a declarative uh, declarative way of defining your elements however uh, in gtk we don't do that we write everything in an imperative form and we define everything in terms of programming statements so it would be easier to compare it to what jsx becomes after transpiling via babel to standard javascript which you ship into the browser and your this jsx actually turns into this react.create element uh, name of the element uh, an object containing all the attributes they want to that you want to assign to it and uh, finally uh, the text content of the said element um so in gtk you do something similar like not syntactically exactly but uh, to define any widget using the new keyword new keyword because every widget is an object like i said so you will find this pattern very often and every widget you will create like this and this is a short end syntax where you want to assign properties to an object there is of course an even shorter way of doing this but we will leave that out for now uh this is equivalent to saying var button equals new gtk button semicolon end of statement and in the next statement you say button dot label equals go button dot sensitive equals false and this is a nicer short end way of saying that so uh, you don't this is a vala specific thing but uh, that's how this works you create something and you assign properties to it much like how you did here and then uh, you are also used to like just defining something using react dot create element does not put it on the screen it simply defines it in memory and when you want to put it on the screen you do this react dom dot render and you select where you want it to go uh, similarly kind of similarly you want to create a window you do, so just like when you get the in web you get the document object available to you in which you can simply document dot to create element and you can do stuff you don't get, you do not get a window object uh, created for you you have to do that manually and you have to add whatever widgets you want to add to it like this window dot add name of the widget so one thing to note here is that uh, anything that is in the scope any widget that you have defined in this scope is uh, readily available to you and you can modify its properties from pretty much anywhere within the scope so that is something to be careful about because uh, it is a powerful approach you can change your objects properties from anywhere but uh, you know what they say about great power it can be dangerous so keep that in mind um similarly there are ways to remove stuff and uh, reposition stuff uh, same way that you do in that you might be used to in javascript dom javascript now that we have talked about uh, tree manipulation you also want to make sure that your uh, widgets show up at the right position on the screen and for that in web you are likely using flex boxes we have something similar on the on the gtk side of things except that we do it in an imperative way in the gtk way so when you define a flex element uh, with display flex and you uh, you may specify a flex direction of column or you may leave it out in which case it will default to row and you may use this uh, recently introduced property called gap i believe this does not get work on all browsers but uh, it is what will uh, define the spacing between the elements so in gtk side we have something similar just uh, imperative so like i said you define a construct an object using the constructor a flex box is called a box so gtk box is what you want to do and uh, it takes two arguments first is the orientation which is either vertical or horizontal which corresponds to column or row in your flex box side and the second argument is the uh, the spacing between the elements which is similar to gap for pixels and adding uh, an item to that box is as simple as box dot append box item of course you can do prepend you can insert it at a specific position 
but uh, this is the most basic way of adding them in a sequence and uh, if, we, if we are talking about layouts we can obviously not miss grid layout and grid works notoriously similar to how it does on the web um so in web you are used to like having a grid parent in a grid container with uh, a number of children which which uh, which will be positioned according to the grid area that you define for them or if you don't define them they will go into the next available slot uh, that that doesn't quite work exactly in gtk but uh, you you have to add each item manually to the grid and you have to specify the position so when you say when you define a grid container you may specify the row gap and the column gap between the element between the children of the grid it works pretty much the same way in gtk you define a new gtk grid and you assign some value to the row spacing and column spacing properties which will work the same way and adding the grid item is also kind of it takes the same things so if you say justify self center and align self and it will in the default case it will correspond to horizontal align center and vertical align end however note that uh, in grid we have the default grid direction set to row and if you change that to column if you say grid direction column and if you in that case align self and justify self will interchange their roles so uh, justify will do it along the vertical axis while align will do it along the horizontal axis however in gtk these are fixed h and v mean horizontal and vertical so you can always say for sure where a certain element will go and uh, note that we do not use uh, the words left and right we use start and end in both places in web and gtk you uh, we do we use the words start and end this is because uh, if you are using a left to right language like english then end will correspond to right and start will correspond to left but if you hard code that to left and right then it might not make sense for somebody who is using it in say hebrew or arabic or urdu then so that's why we specifically say end so gtk will look at what language the user is currently using the application in and decide accordingly what start and end mean and uh, talking about how we want to position the grid elements we okay so we have this grid area property which is a composite which is a like a shorthand where you want where you say in which grid line the positioning of the element begins so in this case it begins at the second grid line horizontally second like second grid row line and the third column line but those this 2 and 3 become 1 and 2 in case of gtk because we use column numbers in gtk and so these line numbers start from 1 in case of web but in the column numbers in gtk start from 0 so 2 and 3 become 1 and 2 so straight forward you just subtract one from them and uh, you use this notation to define how many rows a certain element will span and how many columns it will span you do exactly the same thing in the in gtk when you okay so you grid dot attach a grid item and you specify its position and uh, its span values so it can determine where to place it and how much space to take Uh, next when we talk about uh, styling stuff we talked about layout uh, but when we when i say styling i mean specifically things like uh, colors typography transition margin padding that kind of stuff it's uh, things that don't relate directly to layout as in flex or grid but things that relate to the appearance of the element which has already been placed so in web you are used to let's say there's a text entry and you are used to saying this text entry class flat let's say you want to have a text entry which does not look like a text entry it looks like a 
like a it has no border and there's no background it looks like it's a part of the part of the usual text flow like a span but it is actually in in input if you want to do that style then uh, you will say something like this background transparent border none call you will define a, maybe a css property for the color and uh, you will assign that to the color and you will say font so this stuff in gtk you can do exactly almost exactly the same stuff defining variables is somewhat different you do it like this but uh, everything else is the same you can use a, uh, a subset of the web css in your gtk application and it will do exactly what you expect it to do and the way to add this stuff to an element is uh, you have this you define the element and you can in gtk4 at least you can say entry dot add css class flat but uh, and that works only in gtk4 so in 3 you might want to you do this get style context dot add as flat which also works in 4 both of them work in 4 but this is much nicer uh next uh, one thing that you will do once you have laid stuff out on the screen is you will want to inspect it and see what is going on with it so you can use this command here to enable the gtk inspector it is not it is disabled by default because it is not something which we want and want a user to accidentally trigger so but once you enable it you can either say control shift d to launch it or you can say control shift i while hovering on a widget so it will inspect that widget and <clears throat> it will work kind of like the browser inspector the web inspector you can see each property that is assigned to that and like its value its uh, data type define that which level because uh, so if you have a gtk label then the label is actually a subclass of gtk widget which is a subclass of gtk dot something else so so yeah you can see where it is coming from and what is its value what is its type you can even see the css which is being applied on that so uh, most of the usual stuff that you are uh used to in the web inspector there is a if you look at this if you go into this menu there is even a way to uh, look at the tree the the hierarchy of elements that are going on in the in the window so this is something that you will find useful and lastly let us talk about uh, some of the ui libraries so Okay, so I have given a few web examples here. I I know that uh, jQuery UI is not something we use these days, but uh, if that is something that you may have used in the past, then you will be able to make a fair comparison as to what I'm referring to on the right. So jQuery UI, Material UI, they provide a lot of uh, pre-built uh, widgets and a lot of uh, um, styles layouts. whereas uh, bulma bootstrap and friends provide a lot of css classes which are css styles which are defined in classes uh, and these libraries do kind of the same thing granite is what what the elementary team has developed and it provides a lot of uh, it provides things that comply with the elementary human interface guidelines so you will most in in many cases you will find some of the patterns mentioned in the human interface guidelines implemented in granite because they are not implemented in base gtk standard if they are if they eventually do get implemented then they get deprecated from granite because of course why not by maintain two stuff two two implementations and uh, there's lib handy which provides it was originally developed for uh, the touchscreen devices by purism but of late it has been taken under the gnome umbrella and is maintained by gnome and uh, it provides things like uh, multi touch gestures it provides a 
rounded corners on windows it provides a lot of uh, useful stuff which you find in neither in base gtk nor in granite so you will find that being used in a lot of elementary uh, first party applications as well and uh, so the continuation of uh, handy in gtk4 is called lib advaita which is something that uh, gnome team is maintaining of course because it is pretty much a successor to handy handy will not be ported onwards to gtk4 from what i know and lib advaita will replace it even in the gtk4 so you will want to use either of these depending on what gtk version you are using and what features you need of course not every application might benefit from those but yeah they are uh, useful libraries that you want to keep in mind and uh, now for a few resources you want to go and check out the elementary developer documentation of course which is a great starting point which uh, defines all the standard all the recommended steps to develop an application in vala it focuses on vala but uh, the, at least the build process and uh, other and the git procedure is something which you can apply to pretty much any language so go and check it out i will of course i will uh, host these slides on the web so you will be able to open this up and click on this link directly uh so of course you go and check it out and also check out the human interface guidelines if you want to see how an application is designed next uh, if you want to so gtk this is a page that lists out all the gtk all the css properties that are all the subset of css properties that are supported by gtk one thing that you will instantly notice is that this does not have the display property like display flex display grid display block whatever it this does not have that because that is defined in the imperative part of the program that is defined via whatever vala or whichever whichever language you are using so but it has all the styling elements like so like we saw earlier and uh, you will see most uh, you will see text uh, stuff color transform color and opacity margins paddings the usual stuff uh if you also if you are choosing vala then do go through the official vala tutorial yeah, on the gnome wiki this is this is pretty much uh, all you will need if you have worked with another programming language but if you are new to programming itself that is a different story the i believe there are other resources i don't know um so yeah go through this this will explain the vala language to you and uh, once you understand the language but and you want to move forward to how to use the ecosystem that comes with vala how to look at the libraries then vala doc is your friend it apparently stays crunchy even in mil i have no idea what that line <laughs> means <laughs> but that is the tag line and this will uh, so this has a list of all the g no all the g object libraries which is something uh, so yeah so g object is the underlying system that powers uh, jlib and gtk and the uh, entire ecosystem so you will see uh, an exhaustive near exhaustive list of all the libraries that are supported in there and uh, you will see some useful packages like uh, the gwe or g g uh, g is for data structures you find things like promises and maps and sets in here or there's a library called soup for http connections a lot of useful stuff in here and these links are also quite useful if you want to get started with vala language so yeah go and check out vala doc org and uh, that is all from my side thank you for watching that was a fascinating talk and now it's time for a live q and a with darshik and elementary co-founder cassidy 
Hey, thanks for joining us. And uh, again, a great talk. Um, I know we were talking a little bit before about how you didn't get a chance to introduce yourself very well on your during your talk. So um, I guess first, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I am Darshak and uh, I've been using elementary OS for like six years now and uh, have developed a couple of apps for that. If you know, if you come across an app called Badger, that is my fault. And I have an upcoming app, which we, which I will release directly on Odin. It's called Obliviate. Look out for it. And yeah, I do contribute once in a while. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. It's great to put, um, you know, faces to names and faces to, to apps. You know, people may have used the app and never knew the person behind it. Now they do. Um, so I know sometimes developers, especially those familiar with web technologies, can struggle to know if they can or should include web content in their native apps. You know, they're coming from a, a world of web development and they're building a native app. Um, I guess, can you touch on that a bit? Can they, should they? Do you have a recommendation for that? Uh, yeah, so it depends. If you are showing some data which comes from like a nice API, then do not display the web content. Display it in, uh, in as native a way as possible so that you can use the platform's features like text text magnification or dyslexia-friendly text, text or... Uh, so all of that stuff will integrate well if you are using the native components to build your app. However, if some there are some use cases in which you might want to display web content, there's this app called QuickDoc, which uh, is basically a site-specific browser for Valadoc and uh, some web docs. So it displays the web content of those sites, basically, and makes it easy to navigate. So for that, it makes sense. If it's a use case like that, it makes sense. Otherwise, you want to go with native whenever possible. Yeah, exactly. If, if you're pulling in third party data that that is only available as you know, in a web format, then then it can make sense there. As long as the, the majority of your user interface and the thing that, you know, users actually interact with isn't done in web um, technologies, as long as it's native. Uh, and actually, for, for anybody watching at home, the App Center submission guidelines uh, explicitly omit web apps um, or apps that provide most of their UI in a, a web frame for being accepted in App Center. But including rich content in WebKit is a huge advantage of, of GTK and our platform. Um, apps like Mail, the native Mail app, use a web view to render emails, but the interface for the app itself is done in, in native GTK. So there's there's always kind of a trade-off and, and a line there that you can find in your app and what makes sense. Um, somebody asked if there is a... Um, there's an NPM package called Node GTK that you can use to develop GTK apps with Node.js. Um, can you touch on that a little bit if you're familiar with it? Yes, uh, I am familiar with this package. Node GTK is uh, it's an attempt to to base the GTK bindings on the Node.js platform rather than the Spider Monkey engine which GJS uses, uh, which would be a huge advantage because you would be able to use most of the Node.js dependencies that you can fetch from npm and however uh, from what i last know about node gtk it is not as mature as gjs at the moment so you might want to wait a while before using it in production but definitely something to keep an eye out on yeah yeah so i know if you're a web developer coming from that world you're very familiar with node and npm um, and i guess the the equivalent there if you're going full in on native development is you know there are development libraries that are included in the operating system or made available as dependencies in the operating system so it's a little bit of a shift in thinking i know i, I come from a web background and now do native development so it's it's a little bit of a shift in thinking that the operating system itself provides all your dependencies um, but of course, now with Flatpak, you can also vendor your dependencies into your app as well, more like what we're familiar with with web development. So it's kind of we're kind of seeing both worlds there of of um, being able to depend on the platform's existing uh, existing libraries and vendoring your own. So that's definitely a place to look as well as into Flatpak. Um, somebody was asking how much, um, or sorry. Uh, they were asking about translations and localization in GTK. And I know that's something that's difficult to do and not really standardized on the web. Can you touch on that a bit with uh, GTK? Yeah. So in GTK, we have the standard Git text and PO or PO, the dependencies that we use for for any app that goes into App Center. And uh, there, is, there is documentation about it on docs.elementary.io as to how to do it very clear instructions on how to do it. 
and even outside the elementary platform even gnome and others use the same uh, use the same standard to translate so it works quite well across the board however in web like i mean i you cannot say that there are no standards there is something in the dom apis but then uh, there's no like a every framework does its own thing angular has its own thing to like uh, do internationalization react has a few libraries going on so everybody does their own thing there's a lot of fragmentation going on in the web side of things uh, not so in the desktop linux world yeah yeah again another advantage of of uh, native platform development is this stuff's been figured out it's been sorted out um it's easy for you to just use the platform defaults instead of reinventing the wheel um, somebody was asking also about uh, how much does CSS, and I know you talked about this a little bit in your talk, but uh, how much does CSS or SCSS translate to GTK CSS coming from web standards? Yes, so so the GTK CSS is a subset of the web CSS and uh, the page that I mentioned on the GTK website will give you an exhaustive list of all the properties that are supported. But in general, you want to if you want to know what will be supported, look for things that you can use to uh, style the elements rather than lay them out and position them on the on the screen. So positioning is something that is usually done with the layouts, the grids, and the boxes of the GTK world, which you do imperatively using whatever language you are using. However, when you want to style, when you want to set a margin, when you want to control the typography, control colors, backgrounds, even transitions, that's probably something you would want to do with CSS. Yeah, yeah. And um, as a follow-up, they were asking too, um, if you can use SCSS for in, in your third-party app uh, on elementary OS. Um, we've, we've talked about we use SCSS when we develop the this platform style sheet, but it gets translated into CSS. So they're asking, can you use SCSS? Yeah, so the elementary style sheet has uh, is entirely written in SCSS, and uh, so you can, in theory, use that for apps. I have not tried that, but I believe you should be able to do that by requiring the SAS dependency in your Mason and uh, adding the instructions for that. And you will want to compile those before uh, before doing the before installing all the dependencies into the system, like before triggering the you know the process the build process. Like yeah. it would be the first step in your build. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And another thing I think it's important to mention is uh, GTK CSS has support for some SCSS like functions like um, color mixing, alpha transparency, uh, even variables. Um, those are all included as part of GTK CSS. So sometimes when you want to do, when you know you can do something in SCSS, um, it might be possible to do it just natively in GTK CSS as well. Yeah. Um, and I think we've got just one or two more questions here. Uh, somebody was asking, is there a way to do responsive arrangement in a grid, like switching between a horizontal and vertical layout when the width reduces to a certain size? Is that something you're familiar with? I don't think there's a way to, like there's a, an equally elegant way to do that as we have in the web side of things. But I, but I may not be fully aware about it. Yeah, as, but, as far uh, as it's only something. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. As far as I know, I think that's where um, something like libhandy steps in um, with some of those more responsive design elements. Um, so it's it's not something you do so much in CSS in GTK, but you would do it with a library like Handy or in GTK itself. Um, you could manage those things. I've seen some really cool responsive app demos uh, where the the toolbar changes where it is or how it's oriented exactly depending on the size of the window. So that's. Um, Another way to keep it consistent with other apps on the platform is to lean on those libraries like Handy. And yeah, I think cool. I think that's all we have from the chat for Q&A. Um, thanks again for joining us, and thanks for uh, answering some questions. Thank you very much.